President Weiss, thank you for taking the time to meet with us. You recently announced that you are stepping down from your position as president of Haverford College. So to start things off, how do you see your Haverford legacy? Well, it's great to be with you both. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, well, my legacy, I'm proud of what we've accomplished, though I have not been here that long. And so I recognize on the one hand that my tenure as president is short. Indeed, it probably is the shortest of any of the presidents in the history of the college. And I have mixed feelings about leaving. I love the college. I really enjoyed working with the students, the faculty, the staff, the board. This is a place that has an extraordinarily powerful vision that resonated with me. When I came to the college, there it was a time of transition and some uh, uncertainty about the future. And I feel pleased and satisfied that we did a lot to address those issues in a short time. We produced a strategic plan. We had it approved by everyone in the community. We've been implementing it. We've been raising money. We've been doing lots of good things. So I think my hope is that my legacy will be that the college is on a very good and strong trajectory and that over the next several chapters in the life of the college, Haverford continues to move forward in productive and exciting ways. And that I will be seen, perhaps in a small way, as a part of that. Interesting, interesting. And in terms of, um, we're curious both about your, your, your legacy at Haverford and um, I guess your decision to, to leave, I think that's a lingering question in the community. And so I, I think we're, we're, we're curious about, um, I guess, whether the, the Met approached you or, or, or how you, the, if the Met approached you, did the Met approach you sure. um, and so, sort of, um, I guess, when, when the Met approached you? Yeah, that's absolutely. Like. And it, yeah, absolutely, it's a very reasonable question. I was approached, I had not anticipated that I would leave. I had not had the Met on my list of jobs. I, I wasn't looking for a job, I was happily settled here. And I was approached late November, after Thanksgiving, about whether I was interested in considering this opportunity. So I took a little bit of time to think about it. They approached me because they believed I did not apply for the job. I, as I said, I was unaware of it. They approached me because they believed that my background and my experiences were particularly well suited to this job. And so upon reflection, I thought so too. And on the one hand, as I say, I've been very happy here. On the other hand, for me, given the background that I have, my experience in education, in art, in museum work, in all of the things that go into the job that I'll be taking at the Met, I've had experience around those. And in some ways, this is the most extraordinary job for me imaginable. And so I thought it sooner, certainly sooner than I would have anticipated leaving Haverford, but it was an extraordinary opportunity and a great fit for me and a kind of culmination of my career step. So I took counsel with friends and colleagues here. I spoke with people that, uh, that could counsel me and believed it, would, it is soon to leave. I acknowledge that, but it was for me the right thing to do and in the right time. But I was not seeking a job. I did not apply. And, um, I believed, and they believed, the Met did in the end, that it was a particularly fortuitous fit for me. Mm -hmm. So that's how it all came about. And I was offered the job sometime, I guess, in late February, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I, I guess that's, that's just a, a, a lingering question that we wanted to clear for the community in, in, in that um, the, sort of the timeline there, I guess. Yeah, I, absolutely. I completely understand that. And mm -hmm. I have heard as you can imagine, all kinds of responses. Mm -hmm. This is a job that has a, it's a highly visible job. Lots of people have very strong feelings about the Met mm -hmm. and about Haverford. Mm -hmm. So I've heard from people. I've heard from alumni, I've heard from students, faculty, staff, friends, hundreds and hundreds of responses. And many people are very supportive and happy that I'm gonna be going to do something that is so well suited to me. Others have expressed their disappointment that I'm leaving so soon and they feel like I've let the college down and I feel badly about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that I have, but I, I certainly understand those concerns. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, part of being in this community is, is respectfully engaging and honestly with people. And I appreciate that I have had that kind of interaction with people all over campus. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I do understand that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, our next question has to do more with the timeline of everything. Um, in November 2014, you attended the New York launch of the Lives That Speak campaign, which was held at the Met. Emily Rafferty, your predecessor at the Met, had already announced her retirement at that point. Had you already been contacted by the Met at this point, or was this before that had happened? Before that. I, I, I have a lifelong relationship with the Met as an art historian. 
as I've said publicly, every class I've ever taught anywhere, I've always taken my students to the Met because I think it's the most extraordinary museum in the world, including, coincidentally, two weeks ago I brought my class from Haverford to the Met, which I had scheduled before I knew anything about this job. And so at the Lives That Speak event, the Met in November, I was completely unaware of Emily's status. It just wasn't something I was following. I was just there as a member of the Haverford community. Okay, interesting. And I, I guess we're, we're, we're also interested in your, I guess, career tra trajectory. Um, and you have described yourself as, quote, an, an art historian with a lifelong interest in museums. And I guess we're curious about what also drew you to um, higher education administration. Um, and you've, you've authored um, a, a book with uh, former Swarthmore president uh, about liberal arts education. And so we're, I guess we're, we're curious about um, the marriage of your interests, sort of. Yeah, sure. My whole career has really lived at the intersection of an interest in art, mm -hmm. an interest in cultural institutions, and an interest in higher education. Mm -hmm. When I finished college, I started working at the Kennedy Center in Washington, which is a cultural institution, a performing arts center. And I was involved in administrative work. I was running their gift shops. And um, it sounds like a cute kind of a job, but at the time I got the job, the business was badly broken. There were all kinds of serious issues. And in the end, I had to put more than one person in jail to address those issues. And so right at the beginning of my career, I had an opportunity to learn about the ways in which cultural institutions can do well or do badly, depending upon how they're led. So that was one set of interests. I have also always loved college. I love higher education. I'm passionately interested in the issues around what it means to be at a place like Haverford. So I pursued an academic career. I also have pursued an administrative career. So if one looks over the contour of, of uh, my life and the jobs that I've had, I have done both. And when I was a college professor at Johns Hopkins, I had opportunities to do more and more administrative work because I had experience in those areas. So as a faculty member, I was then department head in the history of art department there. And then I was doing work. I wrote the strategic plan for the School of Arts and Sciences. And then I was asked to be dean there. And those those opportunities came out of an interest and experiences that I had. And so I would say my career has consisted of that kind of back and forth. Indeed, I am the president of Haverford, but I teach every semester because I love that. So I, I taught today. I, last semester, I taught on higher education. This semester, I'm teaching a course in the history department. And I think I've been very fortunate to have had a life and a professional career that has allowed me to explore all of those aspects of my interests. And I feel very privileged because I've had those chances. OK, great. Um, so when you were originally appointed as president of Haverford in May 2012, you asked Haverford to delay the start of your presidency until July 2013 to finish commitments you had made to Lafayette College. So our question is, did you approach the Met with a similar request in order to give Haverford time to find your replacement? Well, the time frames were very different. The Met didn't have that kind of flexibility. and. When I was engaged with those discussions at Haverford, there was, uh, there was just, I wasn't able to make the move at that time. I didn't feel that I could do that. And Haverford had in place a very strong interim president in Joanne Crichton. So Joanne and I agreed, she, she agreed to stay longer. And I worked with her through the course of that year. I was on this campus every week for that time. And she and I were partners in getting the strategic planning process underway. Um, so the time frames worked out differently. Haverford was extraordinarily generous to me and supportive to me. I, I will always be very grateful for that. Uh, the Met timetable was different, and it just wasn't in the cards for me to do that. I also don't believe in the end that it's going to be necessary for Haverford to, do, to have a, a year's delay in the appointment of a replacement. That remains to be seen. It isn't my decision to make. But I think the circumstances were different enough that they just weren't comparable. And early in our conversation, you spoke about some negative feelings that have, you've experienced in the community about your departure, about um, potentially people expressing uh, a degree of disappointment about your, your early um, departure. How would you respond to those negative feelings in the community that you um, are leaving before, um, I guess, your, your full vision is realized? Well, I appreciate, first of all, I absolutely appreciate the candor Everyone who has said something to me has said it in a Haverfordian way, which is thoughtful, respectful, but honest. And I heard lots of expressions of disappointment that 
you did not fulfill the, the kind of term of a normal presidency, and we're disappointed in that. And so I responded to that by acknowledging that I understand that, that concern. I appreciate the fact that people are disappointed, at least in part because they thought the job that we were doing, that I was doing, was a good one. And so I'm grateful for that. But only I can really answer questions about, only I can answer questions about what's right for me and the circumstances that went into my decision, which were more complicated than some people realize. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, these kinds of decisions are a combination of, of public issues and private issues. And I did what I thought was the right thing for me, and ultimately the right thing for Haverford, by making the decision that I did. But I absolutely understand that people who have other views about that, and they don't have all the information either, and I understand that. So. Um, I think that the criticism has been merited and has been respectful, and I've accepted it in those ways. Um, but you know, it, it, it's, there's not much more I can say than that. Okay, so moving on. Uh, do you feel that your resignation has neg negatively impacted financial contributions to the college in any way? I have seen no evidence of that whatsoever. In fact, I just came back from a campaign event in Chicago the day before yesterday, which we had it was very successful, it was well attended, there was lots of positive energy. I think, whereas it may be true that there are some donors who believe very strongly that the basis of their philanthropic support is their relationship to the president, that isn't so much my view at Haverford. I think the view that people, that what drives people to be supportive of this institution is a deep commitment to its values and to its success and to the quality of the vision of the institution. As president, I stand at the forefront of that vision. I articulate it. I have the opportunity and the privilege to help set that direction. But there is no question that the vision of this institution is not my vision alone. It's shared by the faculty, the staff, the students, all of those who wrote the strategic plan, which consisted of all of those groups and others. And I think those who support the college believe in those things, and therefore, Haverford will continue to thrive and be a strong institution, whether I'm president or someone else is president. And the things they're investing in through their philanthropic support are the things that we all think will make the institution stronger. So in the end, it's the quality of the strategic vision and the adherence to the values of the institution that should drive philanthropic support. And I think my success as a fundraiser has been based on aligning those factors with the interests of our donors. So as I step out of the picture, I'm hopeful, and I have every reason to believe, that they will continue to support the institution because in the end, it's the institution they're investing in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Live to Speak campaign is, is still on the tracks, so to speak? Absolutely, yeah, I think it is indeed. We have, uh, we're at about, oh gosh, right now, 100 and, almost 190 million, 195 million, mm -hmm. uh, towards $225 million goal that we, the campaign will come to a completion in two years. I think we will go well past the goal. I think that we're on, we're on track. There's work to be done. We need a new president. We need to carry forward. We need to continue to execute well. But I think the momentum is strong, and the support for the institution continues to be very strong. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so how, moving on to finding a new president, how is the college going to go about finding your replacement, and will you be involved in that process in any way? Uh, I don't know the answer to either question. The, 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 it is the board's responsibility to develop a process to select a president. It is ultimately the board's responsibility to select a president, but they also outline the way in which they want to do that. I am very happy to be helpful and supportive of that process in any way that I can. So if asked to do so, I will do so. But it is uh, not clear to me yet what role I would be asked to play. Certainly, I would be happy to speak with candidates. I would be happy to advise the board on qualities they may look for in a president or issues that may be impeding the search or anything like that that might help them. I have an excellent relationship always and now still with the board. I talk to them all the time. It's very positive, it's very respectful. And so I'm assuming that they'll ask me for counsel and to be involved in the process is in an appropriate way. It is never a good idea for a sitting president to name his or her successor or to be too involved in that. That's, um, that's never a good idea. So I suspect that my role will be at least at an arm's length, but I stand ready to do that and to support the effort as it unfolds. And I guess our, our next question is about previous Haverford leadership, and 
I guess instability in, in Havertz's leadership, most notably the premature departure of President Emerson, has fueled rumors that there is perhaps an organizational issue at, at in founders in, in the administration of Havertz. Um, is this, are, are these rumors, do they have any, is there any, any truth to these rumors? And, and um, I guess, how would you quash them if, if they aren't true? Well, rumors yeah. have a life of their own, and it's very often difficult to, to quash them. Right. Um, I was not here when Steve Emerson was president, so I can't say what did or didn't work well. Mm -hmm. I have a very good friendship with Steve now. He's, mm -hmm. as you may know, an extraordinary supporter of Haverford. He's on this campus mm -hmm. almost every week. He has been a major financial supporter of the college since I've been here, and he continues to support the college in every way he can. He's been supportive of me personally, so and he has an extraordinary job. So whatever went into his decision to leave the college, he's in a place where he's doing world-class work at a world-class institution. Um, so I can't really comment on, on that history. My own experience at the college has been very positive. You have all seen me. I have had a public presidency. Mm -hmm. I work well with the board. I work well with the students. I work well with the faculty. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm going also to a job that is, for me, an extraordinary opportunity. And so I feel very privileged to have had an opportunity to do this job and to go on to do that job. I don't think there's any reason why Haverford cannot hire a world-class president. It is a, an extraordinary place. It is. Uh, for the right person, a joy to be at an institution like this. And college presidencies are assuredly no longer, even if they ever were, easy jobs. It is not an easy job. It's a very challenging job. But this job is, in some ways, especially attractive because the, the, the place is so effectively mission-driven, and it's so clear what is asked of a president here, that, that you, one doesn't get confused about mixed signals from the board and the faculty. Everybody is here for the same reason, and it is to provide a world-class experience for undergraduates to have an excellent academic educational formation combined with the kind of values and uh, ethical foundation that comes with what it means to be at a Quaker institution. And everybody's rowing together. So I think a president who resonates with that mission would be delighted to be here, and I believe they can hire a world-class president. And as you can see, it's a very nice office. You even have a fireplace. <laughs> so that's right. It's all good. So in your remaining few months as president, what are the next steps for your presidency and what are your plans for your remaining time? Well, I'm pulling, moving along, uh, working I should say, full on as Haverford's president. So there's all kinds of day-to-day -day work that goes into being the president. And so I have meetings through the day with students, faculty, staff, as I mentioned. I'm teaching, so I spent my morning teaching. Then I met with students and met with uh, various uh, senior staff later in the day. I'm meeting with you now. After this meeting, I'll go straight to a faculty meeting where I'll give a presentation on the finances of the college. And then after that, I have a dinner with the diversity task force. That's a typical day for me. And it will be a typical day for me until I'm finished. So on the one hand, it's carrying on full steam, doing the work of being president. And earlier in the week, as I said, I was in Chicago for uh, an event related to the capital campaign. And we are in a phase this is a very, in some ways, a very cyclical kind of, or a seasonal kind of a job. From now until commencement, it's very busy getting the academic work of the year completed. There's a lot of work related to faculty hiring and to budgets and to all kinds of things like that. So from now until commencement, that's what I'll be focused on. At some point, when a new president is named or an interim, I will begin working very closely with that person to help in the transition, to tell them what I can. And I suspect that work will take up a lot of my time after commencement. Uh, so in some ways, this year is not that different from any other year because the work re needs to be done, and I'm doing it. Um, after reunion in June, things will quiet down a little bit. I am taking an alumni, a Haverford alumni group, on an art history tour of uh, Italy and Greece in June, which will be my last official action as president. I can't wait, it'll be a great trip. I look forward to that. We have about 45 or so alumni traveling with us. So that's, uh, that'll be the last thing that I do. And then after that, I'll pass on my responsibilities to my successor sometime in early July. Okay, great. Well, that wraps it up. Thank yeah. you so much again for meeting with us. Sure, my thank pleasure. You. I enjoyed having an opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, well, thank you. Sure.